All right, everybody, come on. Welcome to New Life Church. Glad to have you guys here. Yeah. Oh, man. I love this. This might be our last time, but I love this. I love it. I love it. So there you go, right? Hey, I want to say a big hello to everybody worshiping at all of our campuses. So we're glad to have you guys at Ogallala and North Platte. I want to stop right now and just say a big welcome to everybody that's worshiping with us online. And I want everybody that's in our, you know, one of our venues right now to be listening to me. Uh, look, on our online campus right now and going forward from this day, we, uh, we are... We're now committed to having a pastor who is on the online campus. So right now, if you're watching online, you can actually say hello to Pastor Dean. He's on the online campus today. That means this, that if you have something about this sermon that you really like, you get to say, amen, exclamation mark, right? And interact with people. If you got something you don't like about it, then you can just log off. So... Pretty cool, huh? Pretty cool. What a world. What a world we live in. You know, like if you don't like something that's happening right now, it's really awkward to get up and walk out because the person speaking might call you out, right? Or whatever. But now you can just like click. Or, you know, something comes up, you can actually hit mute. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't hit mute, okay? No, look, you know, it's like everything, right? God's word, it challenges us. And so there's moments when there's things that really stand out to you. There's things that kind of really, like, get at you, and they challenge you, and you're wondering maybe what other people are thinking about it. You know, one of the things you can't do here is you can't talk with one another. But when you're watching online, you can actually interact with each other. You know, another thing that uh, you can do while you're online is you can click right down. There's like a little button that says, you know, live prayer. You can click on the live prayer button and submit a prayer request. It goes straight to Pastor Dean. It depends on how many people are doing it at that time. It might take a little moment, but it opens up a separate chat window uh, for an online campus pastor where they can actually interact with you on that particular issue live at the moment if they're not overwhelmed with other things. And so, look, as a church, if you're interested in helping us pastor and pray for people on the online campus, I want you to take out one of our commitment cards right now. And if you're online, then I just want you to like send a little message to the dean. If you're interested in potentially helping us with our online campus, uh, we're, we're looking for some people that might want to help. Okay, now look, we're screening people seriously. Okay, and we're looking for spiritual gifts, not just willingness. Because we can have a few different people on the online campus so that Dean, as I say, is the pastor, but there could be a handful of others that are saying, look, if a prayer request comes in, I'll be willing to take the prayer request. And they just take the prayer request off over to the side, and they pray with people right then, and then they jump right back into the online. And you never really kind of leave what, what's happening on the broadcast site. So please let us know. Fill out a commitment card. Turn it in at one of our green tables. If you're at one of our venues today, um, send it out as a message to Dean. And we're going to do our best to see, you know, who, who might be a good fit for this online campus and help us out with that. Okay? Does that sound good? Okay, good, because we might all be using it really, really soon uh, to worship. And that could be a really fun day. It opens up a whole new opportunity. I mean, think about this. Think about we're not here, right, but we're all at our individual homes and we're watching, okay? And, and then you can say to your neighbor, join us, join us for church online, right from your living room. That's where I'm going to be today. I, I just think that the opportunity as we move forward is that the best days are still ahead of us, not the worst, even if we can't join here and worship, uh, that some of our best days of outreach, some of our best days of speaking life into people could be ahead of us, guys, when moments like this happen. And so I want you to see it that way. Yeah, sure, you might go, well, Pastor, you're just, a, you're just the guy who, who sees the cup almost full all the time. You better believe it because Jesus is still in control. That's why I believe that. Man, alive, come on, people. But I do want to talk to you about something that's important today, and that's this. How do you follow God in difficult days? Sound pretty fitting? How do you follow God in difficult days? I think we all understand that it's easy to follow in good days. Like, uh, let me give you an example. I was in the military, all right, and it was easy to be a soldier during peacetime. Well, not totally easy. There's still people that have, you know, their power struggles and different things they want you to do, like you're going to get an inspection and you don't have grass growing and they want you to go spray the dirt with, you know, a green can of spray can. So, 
There's, there's crazy things like that. But it's a lot more difficult to be a soldier during wartime. And so how do you follow God in difficult times? Oh, to, to help us process this topic today, I want to get an image stuck in your mind, okay? I want to take you to an image that maybe some of you use, others you know nothing about. It's a compass. Now, a compass, I want you to tell me something that you know about a compass, okay? So not, don't just tell me random things, all right? Let me, I'm going to ask the question for one second. I know, somebody's like really excited about compass, and they just want to like tell us everything they know about compasses. Um, I got one, one real question, and that's this. Which direction does the needle want to point? But more specifically, more specifically, it wants to point where north? Somebody said true, some said magnetic north. True. That's the deal. It wants to point north. Now, let me ask you a battery of questions. Does it want to point north when the sun is shining? How about when it's raining? What about when it's snowing? Okay, how about this? How about if a blizzard happens, does it still want to point north? How about if a tornado happens, does it still want to point north? Right, and what I'm saying to you today is this, whether you're standing on a mountain peak of life or you're standing in the valley of life, the needle of the compass always wants to point north. The very same thing is true with God. God established truth is still a truth even in difficult days. God truth always points north. It always points north, no matter whether you're going through incredible days or you're going through your worst day, the truth of who God is and the truth of God's word is still true in your most difficult day as it is in your best day. Just like the needle of a compass points north, so does the truth of God point north even in difficult days. Seriously? That's all I get out of that statement? I'm just saying, I'm suggesting to you Thank you. It's not about me. I get that. You're not clapping for me. I'm just saying that, guys, that, that vivid image is what I want you to hang on to today. In fact, I, it's what I want you to hang on to as we go through some challenging, difficult days, that God's truth doesn't change from the good days to the difficult days. I think some of us think that happens, but that's not the truth. In the series that we're in, The Judges, I thought, you know what? It's very fitting that the, the scripture I wanted to use, I, I'm not going to preach it exactly the way I wanted to. I'm just going to highlight a portion of it. But it's, it's extremely fitting to this issue of God being the same in the good days and in the difficult days. Gideon is the one who really, I think, learned this lesson. Judges chapter 6 through chapter 8 is where you will, you're really going to find it, okay? So if you've got your version app, then you're going to want to use that. Uh, I'm going to give you some backstory to what what we're going to really look at. And here's, here's the backstory. The first thing we're going to do is go to Judges 6, verses 1 and 2. And I want you to see this, okay? Read, read the first sentence with me. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight, period. Stop. Okay, full stop on that one. If you've been here the last few weeks since we started this series, this is not the first time we've heard this. Remember, there's this cycle that they're in of sin that leads to oppression, that leads to the stress, where they're crying out, that leads to deliverance. Once again, they've worked their way right back into sin, worship of other gods, apostasy, a heart that's bent away from God. So the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight, so the Lord handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. For seven years, church, the Midianites were so cruel that the Israelites made hiding places for themselves in the mountains, caves, and strongholds. They can't even live in their own communities. They can't even live in their own towns. Here's the reason why. Every single year, the Midianites and others, by the way, they would bring all of their friends, and they would come marching into the land where the Israelites were at, and they would take over at the premier moment. The premier moment. Here's what it was. Every year, the Israelites plant crops. The, cl- the crops were coming up at, at the harvest time for the crops, which in Israel could be multiple times throughout the year, not like it is here. At the harvest time for the crops, the enemy came in. He camped amongst the crops. He ate all the crops, and he, took up, he ate up all their animals. And he left them in a state where the Israelites are right now in a moment of starvation. They're concerned for their very life. They're not certain of their own future. And the Israelites decide after seven years of this chaos, let's cry out to God. And what does God do when they cry out to him? 
What happens when we cry out to God in our distress? We've learned this from Judges. God sends a deliverer. The deliverer this time is a young man by the name of Gideon. Now, unlike last week, if you were following with us, unlike last week, Gideon doesn't have some big fancy title. He's not the commander of some army. He doesn't have a lot of leadership skills, at least from what we've discerned. Okay, so he doesn't have a title, he doesn't have leadership skills, he isn't some big, you know, bad warrior, but God chose him anyways. And this is what happened when God chose him. I want you to watch the dialogue that the Israelites are living in this oppression, okay? That's where they're living at, but look how God sees them versus the way they see themselves. Because it's, the, it's a great picture of God's truth being the same because God doesn't change based on the difficult days that you and me are going through. So let's take a look at this. We're going to go to Judges chapter 6. I've got my Bible here, if you've got your Bible. And we're going to look at Judges chapter 6. And we're going to start in verse 11. And then we're going to read just for a few verses. If you don't have a Bible, you can look at the screen. Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree of Ophrah, which belongs to Joash of the clan of Abizer. Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing, threshing wheat excuse me, at the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and he said this, Mighty hero, the Lord's with you. Sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all of this happened to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say that the Lord brought us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and he said, Go with the strength that you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I'm sending you. But Lord, Gideon replied, How can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh. And I am the least of the entire family. Then the Lord said to him, I'll be with you and you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. Where do you find Gideon in this story? Remember back, where was he at? He's in a wine press doing something though. Crushing grain in a wine press. Why? So that the enemy can't get it. Here's what he's doing, he's hiding. In the midst of this oppression, Gideon is hiding. But when the angel of the Lord comes, when God comes to meet with him, he sees him differently than, he see, than Gideon sees himself, doesn't he? How does he see him? He sees him with some crazy words. He calls him what? A mighty warrior. Say mighty warrior. Mighty warrior. That's how he sees him. He sees him as a mighty warrior. Warrior, but that's not how Gideon sees himself because Gideon turns around and he says, what are you talking about? Like, I'm part of a tribe of the lowest of all tribes and I'm the lowest of all people in the tribe. That's how he sees himself. You ever see yourself that way? In the most difficult of days? You ever see yourself as the weakest, the lesser, right? You ever see yourself as, you know, un unqualified? You ever see yourself that way? Because I want to tell you something Today, in the difficult days that you and me are currently walking through, and the days that most likely will get more difficult, that God sees the warrior that he made you to be, even in your most difficult day. So if you don't see the warrior in you, today should be a reminder. God made you a warrior to deal with the most difficult days that are ahead of you. He prepares us for them. He gives us strength to overcome them. That's what he gives us. He gives us wisdom to press through them. But the problem here is this, and this is a trend for all of us, all right, that we tend to drift from our faith. We tend to drift from our faith from the good days to the difficult days. We drift in our faith. We, we kind of go from this is anchored in truth to days get difficult and we start to drift and we start to wonder to ourselves, is there really a God? Is God really out there? Is he really doing what he said that he would do? Gideon was drifting from his faith. How do I know that? Because he says these words back to the Lord. Basically, he says this, look, I've heard of the power and the wonder and the awe that you have, God. I've heard of it. I've been told of all of the incredible stories of how you delivered our people even up out of Egypt and the amazing things that happened with that. But I'm not seeing it today. 
Since I'm not seeing it today, I wonder where you're at. And in a moment like this, that we're walking through these difficult times, it's going to be a challenge for some of us, more than others, to be reminded that even in the difficult days, the power of God to open up the Red Sea, like he provided for them to get out of Egypt, is the same power of God that's at work even in our difficult days. And guys, when we forget that, then we lose ourselves. And Gideon had lost hope in the difficult days because he started to doubt the very power, authority, and wonder of God. So what does that tell us? It tells us this, that we are our best. We're at our best during the difficult days when we remember that God's wonder and his power is still at work and we keep faith in the fact that even though we might not be seeing it the same way, he still has the authority and power to be working, and he is, by the way. He may not be working in the way you're asking, But the same God that was working in our good days is the same God that is at work with the same power and authority in our most difficult days. And guys, I just think God wants us to remember that the compass needle of his truth always points north. It's always pointing north. God's not overcome by what's going on in the world around us today. So let's talk about it for a minute. Let's talk about it. You know, I mean, look, we're we're all wrapped up. We're, We're all like got our minds bent on this coronavirus and what's going on, and rightly so. It's serious. It's serious. And look what I just, when I said it was serious, guess what my, my iPad did? Just guess. Yeah, Siri's like, that's not available. <laughs> well, thank you, Siri, I already know that. I probably shouldn't say that word. Don't say that word, by the way. Don't be messing with my notes right now. But we got our mind, and it, it, it's really kind of, it's all wrapped up around that. I was proud. I was proud on, uh, on Friday. Um, our president came out, um, and he declared a national state of emergency uh, for our nation. And I think the part that really kind of made me, made me proud was when he quickly associated today to be a national day of prayer, that we would all focus in and be praying for our nation, praying for our leaders, praying for um, you know, a cure to this virus, praying that God would protect our nation. I mean, I don't know about you, but I am thankful to be alive today and living in a nation where a president who's not a perfect man is willing to, to lead us and direct us to an attitude of prayer. Amen. Guys, that's a blessing, that in the midst of chaos, you shouldn't forget that. And so today, at the end of my message, we are gonna take time and we're going to follow that directive, and we are going to pray. But the reality is this, right? And unless there is a miracle for this cure, uh, the cure, unless there's a miracle for this virus or a, you know, a cure it comes about in one way or another, uh, most likely the prediction is that things will get worse before they get better. And that's the unfortunate truth of the time in which we live in. And so what should we, what should we do? Well, as a church, we're trying to prepare for the worst, but we're trying to believe for the best. And I think that any great leader right now is doing that, whether it's a business or it's our schools or uh, any, any of those components. We're, we're trying to prepare for the worst, but we're believing God for the best. So look, as believers in Jesus Christ, there are many truths of God that always point north that I want to remind you of to hang on to during this season. Okay, so we don't lose sight of who we are like Gideon did. I want you to be reminded of the power and authority of God. So here's a few thoughts, right? That God is still in ultimate control. That's, that's an absolute truth. Just hang on to that. Don't lose sight of that. God is still in absolute control, ultimate control. And that means, look, we don't need to perpetuate fear in our conversations with one another. We don't need to perpetuate fear by the way that we panic or that we overreact. All right, Um, we got to stay focused on taking care of our family while serving the immediate needs of others that are close to us. God's put some people around you that you need to take care of, you need to love during moments like this because this is just a season and this season will pass. I just need to let you know that, okay? So we got to remain confident in the power of God's control during this time. So God's ultimately in control. Another thought that I want to remind you of that's a constant truth that always points north in times of difficult times, is this, that God is fully engaged. So I think guys might say, like, okay, I get it, God's in control, but I don't think he's engaged. That was the Israelites. That was Gideon, right? 
that he was wondering, God, you're not engaged. I've heard of these empo- this power that you have, but you're not engaged. And I need to remind you today that God's fully engaged and he's working all things for our good. It's an absolute truth that you can't lose sight of, church. An absolute truth. Psalms 46 reminds me of this. It says that God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of what? That's the deal. He's always ready to help, guys, in times of trouble. But what is God waiting for? God's waiting for us to cry out to him. Leaders who need wisdom during this time cry out to God. And trust that the Holy Spirit will whisper into our hearts exactly what we need to do and when we need to do it. But let's let faith increase during this time. How can faith increase in your hearts during this time? By crying out to God. (laughs) It's amazing that when, you know, stress comes, when we cry out to God, faith can increase. Cry out to God in prayer. Cry out to God. Pray for your leaders. Pray for your family. Pray for our nation. Pray for health. Pray for a miracle. Cry out to God, right? Because look, we're going to get knocked down. Some of us are going to get knocked down because of what we're going through. But we don't have to get knocked out because God's with us. Did you hear me? You're going to get knocked down. Things are going to happen that you don't want to have happen. But we're never knocked out when God's with us. Yeah, but you're like, well, Jeff, I'm like, the coronavirus is taking people's lives. I get it. I, I got that. As a believer in Jesus Christ, even if the coronavirus took your life, you're not knocked out. Even if the coronavirus takes the life of someone that you love and knows Jesus Christ, they're not knocked out for the count. You might have got knocked down on this earth, but the next thing you know is you arise face to face with Jesus Christ. That's that's power. That's authority. That's like the kind of love that we want to walk in from our Savior. So guys, God's fully engaged and he's working all things for our good. The next truth I want to remind you of is this, that God's still a healer. God's still a healer. He still has the power and authority to heal. And I think that this is the moment where we need to be praying, praying for a cure to this virus more than we complain about it. Somebody needs to write that one down. We need to pray for the cure more than we complain about it. Let let our lip, like in our tongue is life and death. So so pray, pray for God to work a miracle and let's, let's, we know that he can and we know that he will at some point in some fashion, in some way. And let's let this health crisis remind us that God's a healer in all things. Because look, I just had my grandkids over to my house and I'm just gonna tell you, they're amazing. I love them. They're awesome. They're little germ-carrying kids. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? I mean, they're, but they're not, this, they're not carrying things like the coronavirus, right? They might be carrying the modern-day flu. They might be carrying something else. Oh, look, there's other sicknesses that are all going around at the same exact time right now. And so it kind of puts us all on a heightened alert. So here's my suggestion is this. Since we, live, since we live on earth that's imperfect and it's a season where there's a lot of sickness that's going around, corona is just one of them, let's be people of prayer and believe that God can heal. Amen. Okay? And let's ask God. God, work miracles in modern day medicine as they're striving hard to come up with, you know, a cure for this virus. I believe that that's part of the way God works miracles today. That's just my personal belief. Um, I believe that God can supernaturally heal as well, though. Here's another one, that God's still asking us to be a light in the darkness. That's an absolute truth. It doesn't matter what time period you live in. It doesn't matter how difficult things get, how challenging they get. If it's a medical thing we're dealing with today, and if it's a persecution of the, of the church tomorrow, it just doesn't matter that in the midst of darkness, God's always asking us to be light. And right now, church, I would say this. I think that your, um, your coworkers, your neighbors, and your friends are more open to your faith right now. Seize the moment. What, what do I mean by that? I just mean this. Like when I was on Bourbon Street a few weeks ago and we were praying for people, most people said, yes, you can pray with me. That tells me this. Your neighbor is, is open to your faith if you're willing to exercise it and pray with them. Hey, look, ask them. Hey, you got anybody in your family that's, you know, at, at, uh, at a higher risk during this time period? Yeah, they might go, well, it's my parents. Well, hey, look, <clears throat> I want to pray, <clears throat> pray with you um, about that. 
Um, and, and instead of going, I'm going to pray for you, can I pray with you? Yeah. It's a simple little switch. Simple little switch. Okay? Now look, if you're in an office area, you might want to ask him, step into my office. Let me ask you a question. Can I, I, I don't want to just pray for you. I want to pray with you. And so make it comfortable for them, right? Don't stand up in the midst of the cafeteria at work or, you know, wherever you're at and just like lay hands on them and start speaking in tongues. That's going to be weird. <laughs> Nobody's going to like that, okay? They're not going to like it. People around you aren't going to like it. And you're going to walk away feeling great about yourself and you're the only one duped. <laughs> so, but with, this is an opportunity where people are open to your faith. Historically, historically when... Nations have gone through difficult seasons. People have drifted towards a Christ-centered solution. Okay? Historically, that's what's happened, and I believe that's what's going to happen again. However, this time, there, there may not be the traditional um, open doors of a church on a Sunday to receive them. You know what I, this is what I like about this moment we're in. You're like, what, you found something you like? Yes, I found something I like. This is what I like. The ownership of Christianity is being displaced from the corporate picture of the church and being put right where it belongs into the biblical picture of the church, the believer. And where the doors of the Sunday worship are being maybe shut down for a season, Christ is still the answer and you're not going to be able to invite them to your church you're going to have to invite them to prayer, and you're going to have to be the person that's telling them about the solution of Jesus Christ. I think that has the opportunity to make us stronger and make us better. Amen. It's a little bit of being put into the fire, okay? So, uh, look, welcome to the fire, folks. Welcome to the fire. This is an opportunity where you get to be the example of Jesus Christ, the light in the darkness. We're going to work with you. We're going to help support you. We're going to do everything we can. But that's what's going on right now. So look, I just want you to know we're, mon we're monitoring the state. We're monitoring local governments. Uh, we're tapped into a couple of other resources, Two Rivers uh, Medical is one of those. Um, you know, even, even this week, you know, I called out to a couple of other key leaders that are in our community, just asking for some advice, seeing what they're doing, what's going on. We as a church are trying to stay connected um, to all of the key entities in our community so that we know what to do. Because I do believe that it gets, it, it, there's a potential for it to get worse before it gets better. And that means this could literally be the last time we meet. If this was the last time that we could meet for a while, live in person, then we're going to continue worship, by the way. It's just going to go online. All right? And if it becomes necessary for us to do that, you need to make sure you know how to get, you need to be connected with us. You can get connected with us as we broadcast live on Facebook Live. All right? Right now, we're broadcasting at 11 a.m. All right? But if we have to go to a worship online only, then we will be broadcasting multiple times uh, throughout the day on a Sunday, not just one time. And you'll be able to connect with us at multiple different times. And we'll promote that and we'll give you the schedule and we'll shoot it all out there. All of those things are being worked on right now as contingency plans so that if we have to, we've got them written down as policies and procedures. We just pull it out, we pull the trigger and off we go. And there's no scrambling to know what we need to do. Uh, so be watching for that on Facebook Live. Also, you can go to mindnewlifechurch.com, which people are watching us right now on both of these platforms. MyNewLifeChurch.com is where you're going to get um, our online campus platform where you can submit the, uh, the prayer request, interact. Obviously, you can interact with Facebook Live as well. We welcome you to join us on any one of those platforms at any one of the times that we might broadcast. The other thing is what about life groups? Well, our life groups are going to, many of them will continue, maybe even meeting in homes um, because it's a small group. Others will choose to like, go online. And so we actually have um, a Zoom account, and we're, we will be willing to purchase more Zoom accounts so that we have enough platforms uh, for this season of time so that life groups can actually be uh, meeting in a digital world. If you haven't used Zoom, it's kind of like a face-to-face, -face interactive kind of a, a platform. Is it, is it as good as being together in person? No. Right, But when you're together in person for a while and then you start interacting with this medium of, of the internet, it, it really does serve a great purpose. Okay, And we use it all the time here. And so you can easily meet online, discuss, watch videos together, and pray with one another. That's going to happen. It's going to be uh, great opportunities. 
If we, are, if we have to postpone the gathering together and we worship online, our children's ministry is actually right now preparing, they're creating all the material so that we, can, we will be broadcasting a children's service online for your kids. Yeah, and we're gonna be providing moms and dads with material to help disciple your kids as, as you need to as we go through a season like this. So that's gonna be a lot of fun. A kid's service online, I might even attend. Right, I can't. I, I just want to see what it's going to look like. So, uh, we'll. I, I hope that we get to get to use some of that stuff in one way or another. Uh, our youth are actually working diligently right now. They've got a game plan already designed to go live online on Wednesday nights, and it's a whole different look. It's a whole different look to youth ministry. Uh, but it's, I'm excited about some of these ideas, and if we have to use them then we've got things in place that we can use. So look, these creative ideas will allow us to remain consistent with our cause. That's what we're doing here. Why? Because we're never going to abandon the mission of the church, but we might have to change the methods of the church. Does that make sense? Okay, the methods. This is a method right now. Meeting on Sunday morning, where we're at, okay? You meeting online is a whole nother method. And if we're all meeting online, it's just a different method, same mission. Our cause is this, to see people find Jesus and lives changed. And it doesn't matter whether we're in the difficult days or we're in the good days, we're not abandoning the cause. We're still going to invite people to find Jesus, and we're going to still help you see your life be changed. But I'm telling you, the method is going to have to change. So look, our God-given cause is like a compass that always points north. It's a cause it doesn't shake, it doesn't rattle, it doesn't warp, it doesn't change from the good days to the bad days. Our cause to see people find Jesus and lives change is like the compass needle pointing north. The methods of how we get there might change. And so one of the very logical reasons of why we may not meet together live, but we might meet online together live, is things like this. When you see graphs that uh, you know, have been put out by different agencies, it helps us understand that if we do nothing with this virus, then we're gonna end up with this peak, meaning there's a lot of cases and they overwhelm the system. They overwhelm the medical system, okay? They overwhelm what our government's able to do in, uh, in you know, helping to take care of people in incredible need. If we do nothing, this is the prediction. If we do something about it, it might take longer, but then we don't overwhelm our medical system. So what, what we're saying is this, if we just keep meeting together in large groups like this with the coronavirus going active and community spreading of it, which is yet to happen in our area, and we meet together, then we're perpetuating the peak, which that means more people die, more people are injured, more people are wounded by the coronavirus. So if we have to stop meeting, we're doing it for a very strategic reason to team up with our local and state government and wisdom that's happening in our city so that we can make sure that our systems are not overwhelmed and we can love and take care of one another in a better way, which is the way I wanna close this message today. We need to operate out of love and trust for one another during this season that we're walking through. Jesus said it this way in John 13. He says, look, your love for one another will prove to the world that you're my disciples. Your love for one another. Love looks different at different times, but it's still love. I could tell you, unfortunately, too many stories where love looked like a spanking when I was a child. Which one do you want to hear about? <laughs> but that was love. I know that was love. As I even look back on it, I don't doubt ever being put in that situation as a child, doubting the love of my father as he took me through that moment of love. But love looked different at that moment. So love this week looks like this. We get to gather together. But love, love could be that you stayed home today because you're sick and we want to thank you for that. You love the rest of us by taking that sacrifice. Love next week might look like all of us are online because that's what it's going to require for us to love one another. Okay? So love, it's going to look different at different times, but it's still love. Lastly, we have to trust each other. Assume the best in people before you assume the worst. You know why I'm here today? Because I trust you. You're part of the body of new life, and I trust you that if you were sick, you would have stayed home. I trust you. I'm assuming the best in you before I'm assuming the worst. 
until you force me to assume the worst, I'm going to assume the best. Guys, don't lose trust of one another in a time where there's isolation and we're trying to distance ourselves from others. Don't lose trust in people, okay? And don't lose trust in this body. So there's a level of joy that I have and peace that I have of worshiping with you today because I trust you. And I also need you to trust your leaders. Trust those who are making critical decisions at our school level. Trust those who are making critical decisions at our government level. Trust those who have to make critical decisions at our church level. Everybody, I think, is just trying to do their very best. And that's what we're going to try to do here at New Life. Right? We're doing everything within our power and wisdom to create a safe environment so that we can worship God, even if that means that we go online. So guys, let's finish our day today in a moment of prayer. Okay? And I'm going to let you stay seated for this moment of prayer. And then at the end of the prayer, when I say amen, I'm going to invite all of you to stand and then we're going to wrap up our time of, of worship here today with a couple of worship songs. And I just want you to seek God, okay, and let's spend some time with him, and then, um, then our, our campus pastor will come and dismiss us. Let's take a few minutes here, and let's pray over a few different areas. Father, I first off want to start praying for our communities. These communities in which we call home, where our neighbors live, our friends live, our coworkers live. Lord, we want to say thank you, God, that you have protected us to this point, but Lord, we know that what a virus does. There is, there's the facet of a virus that passes from one man to another man, one woman to another woman, and Lord, unless you, unless you just decide that there's a, a zone where sickness like this is not going to happen, then God, we're expecting it to come. But in the midst of that, we're asking that, Lord, you would help us to keep our eyes on you and our hope on you and our faith on you. That even though we walk through difficult days, that we will not lose sight that, Jesus, you are the one still in control. And so at that moment, God, we pray for our leaders. Lord, we pray for our mayor. We pray for Stan. We ask that you would give him wisdom on decisions that he has to make. Here in Kearney, we pray for the mayor of North Platte and Ogallala. We ask that, Lord, you would move upon their hearts and you would give them wisdom beyond their years. We pray for Kent, Kent Edwards, here in Kearney as our superintendent of schools. And we pray for the superintendent of schools in North Platte and Ogallala and surrounding communities that, Lord, you would give them great wisdom in decisions that they have to make. And, Lord, security to know they're making the right decision at the right time because the ramifications are incredible. So we pray for our leaders. Lord, we continue to pray for our governor and our president as we walk through this, that, Lord, you would put the right people around them as advisors and give them real security and let them hear the voice of your Holy Spirit. Speak to them through the power of your Holy Spirit today and bring wisdom to them today. Lord, we pray for those in our community who are most vulnerable. Lord, that if this virus were to hit them, they would be at the, they would be at the place of the most vulnerable to sickness uh, that would cause maybe death. Lord, we pray for them that you would protect them. We pray for our moms and our dads and our grandmothers and our grandfathers, our aunts and our uncles and siblings. We pray for them in Jesus' name that, Lord, you would put your hand of protection upon them today and you would watch over them during this difficult time. Lord, we pray for our church, that our church would be a place of spiritual refuge. That people could run into it and find life and hope and peace, even if it's online only. Lord, let our church be a beacon in our communities. Let let our communities see New Life Church as a resource of spiritual hope during this time that seems like it's difficult and it potentially might even get more difficult. Give us wisdom on how to lead our church so that the message of Jesus Christ can impact the hearts of people and still change lives. Lord, lastly, I want to pray for believers, that believers, new lifers, and other believers in our communities from other uh, Bible-preaching, Jesus-believing churches, that they would remain beacons of hope, of light for Christ in the midst of difficult times and darkness. That, Lord, all of us would be reminded that you are still God and the needle of your compass still points north. That your truth is still truth in the most difficult day as it is, in the best day of our life. That your truth still points north. 
The Jesus who died on the cross for moments just like this. That the power and authority of the universe is in your hands. You are all powerful, all knowing. God, you are, you are a God of wonders and a God of awe. Your power still points north. Let us not forget that in these difficult times. And as we move into worship and we cry out to you, would you hear our cry and would you meet this church right where they're at? And would you remind this church that you are a God of power and wonder and awe? In Jesus' name, amen.